Welcome to lecture 3i. This video session is actually a tutorial on superscalar processors and graphics processing unit. We have already learned some fundamental concepts of superscalar processors, multi-threading, hyper-threading concepts and a few lecture videos on graphics processing unit. This module is a quick recap of many of the concepts learned by taking out few questions and trying to understand it deeper from a designer point of view. Without much delay, let us go into the first question for the day. Which one of the following techniques allow multiple threads to share the functional units of a single processor in an overlapping fashion? So, there are two things that we have to discuss here. One is with respect to multiple threads. You have two threads that is going to run on functional units of a single processor in an overlapping fashion. So, if you have functional units that is available at some point of time, thread T1, then thread T2 and that has to do in a overlapping fashion, means both has to be intermingled. So, there are four choices given, speculative threading, multi-threading, context switching and shared memory processing. Let us try to look into what are the differences between various techniques. Superscalar means I have multiple functional units. And now, at this particular clock cycle, you see two of the functional units are occupied by the threads, the instruction of the thread. So, when you go to the previous cycle, then one of them. So, depending upon the available parallelism among instructions, wherever you see blue dots, these are slots in which the functional unit is being occupied and then white slots which will show that they are not occupied. Now, what we are going to see is about uh, multi-threading. It can be of two level. One is called fine grained, other one is called coarse grained. So, now if you look into, you can see that the blue program is going to run for one clock cycle in which if you look at the functional units, two of the functional units are consumed by the blue program and the two other are empty. In the next clock cycle, there is a context switch. So, blue is no longer there. You are using two red next to functional unit again context switching. So, if you look at horizontally, either there will be part of instructions from one thread or it would be empty. So, blue or white, red or white, yellow or white, green or white, violet only, blue like that. This concept is called multi-threading, but the how frequently the context switch happens, if it happens at a finer granularity every clock cycle then it is called fine grained multi threading. But here you can see that for few cycles blue is continued and then you context switch to the red one, then sometime red is running. So, the context switching interval is little larger, that is why it is called coarse grained multi threading. And here we have symmetric multi processing. Out of the four functional unit, two of them are working with uh, one processor and two other if it is part of the another processor, then these two this is called parallel processing that happens and this is called simultaneous multi-threading where horizontally if you look the basic difference from a multi-threading and simultaneous multi-threading also known as hyper-threading is if you horizontally look it can be empty or it can be part of thread 1 or it can be part of thread 2. So, now if you look into the corresponding answers that you can see multi-threading is the answer where it allows multiple threads to share functional units of a single processor in an overlapping fashion. For some time it is blue, some time it is there. The same question if there is, what is the difference if it is going to be simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threading? In the same time window, you have two different threads going to occupy different functional units in the same thread. So, overlapping means it is in an interleaved fashion. Here, simultaneous multi-threading, there is no interleaving. Simple multi-threading, there is interleaving and the rate at which the interleaving can happen, it is a quick context switching, it is called fine grained. If it is little higher frequency or larger context switching time interval, then it is known as coarse grained multi-threading. In all this case, whenever there is an overlapping, it is called multi-threading. Whether the overlapping is uh, happening in an interleaved fashion, it is called simple multi-threading. If the overlap is in such a way that at the same clock cycle, if you have more than one threads occupying various functional units, then it is called hyper-threading or simultaneous multi-threading. So, for this question, based upon the context, the answer is multi-threading. Now, let us move into the second question. The second question is all on. VLIDIBLE processor, which one of the following statements is false with respect to 
VLIW processors. We know that VLIW stands for very long instruction word. So, the first statement given is VLIW processor operates on long instructions obtained by packaging multiple operations into one instruction bundle. Second one, the hazard detection hardware in VLIW processor helps in reducing the raw dependency stalls. Third one, VLIW processor supports register read for multiple instructions in parallel. And the fourth one is VLIW processor execute instructions that are reordered and scheduled by the compiler. Let us try to understand what is VLIW processor, a quick recap. In VLIW processor, what happens is we create long instruction word. So, this is the long instruction word that you see. So, from the compiler, multiple instructions are now created into bundle. So, in this case, you can see 1, 2, 3. Three instructions are created into one bundle. Who does it? Compiler does it. So, it statically finds parallelism, find the compiler and arranges them into bundle. But if there are not enough instructions that are available, then sometimes there can be slot wastage also. In this case, you can see that. But adjacent instruction, you may not be able to find three instructions what is being given. So, some of the slots go ND. How do you get that many number of lines in order to create the bundles? Typical way in which you do is, is by unrolling, loop unrolling. But when you do loop unrolling, the code size increases. It may create pressure on I cache. But in hardware, there is no hazard detection that you have to understand because compiler understand which all the instructions are having a dependency between them and accordingly parallelism is being brought into there. And so, the whole lot of dependency between instruction or hazards, potential hazards are done by the compiler. So, hardware do not have any detection. So, runtime hardware detection is not there. Because of this, compiler is considered to be slightly complex whereas, it decreases the hardware complexity. So, here you can see that the three instruction, this will go into functional unit 1, this will go into functional unit 2 and this will go into functional unit 3. So, instructions are executed in three functional unit parallelly and they may access the register, caches and memory at the same time and they will produce result. Since there are three instructions going into functional unit at this time and three instructions can potentially execute, this will create an IPC larger than 1. Instructions per cycle is, in this case, it is roughly three instructions that you can see. So, VLIW processor is a superscalar processor wherein a bundle of instruction is being created from a set of potentially parallel instructions by the compiler and they are scheduled on to the hardware and hardware is going to run them. If there is not enough amount of instructions which can be potentially running parallel, that will create a lot wastage, but there is no hazard detection that is being done. With this background, let us try to take one by one. VLAW processor operates on long instructions obtained by packaging multiple operations into one instruction bundle. So, we have heard that about the instruction bundle concept. So, this statement is true. If you look at the second statement, the hazard detection hardware in VLAW processor helps in reducing raw dependency. So, there can be different types of stalls created by raw, war and wow, but here it is telling it is done by a hazard detection hardware. We do not have any hazard detection in hardware in VLAW because the instructions are coming into hardware which are free from dependency, compiler already does that. So, having a hazard detection circuit in hardware is a wrong statement. Third statement is VLAW processor supports register read for multiple instructions in parallel. So, we have seen from the block diagram, they all are connected to the register file and to the cache memory together. So, these functional units will read from these registers in parallel. So, that is true. And the last one VLAW processor execute instructions that are reordered and scheduled by the compiler. Yes. The reordering and the scheduling is already done by the compiler, so the processor only executes that. So, out of the four statements given, only statement B is false, all other three statements are true. So, with the background of VLAW processor, we are able to analyze these statements and come up with the corresponding answers. Now, let us go into the next question, which one of the following facilitates fetching and execution of more than one instruction? at one time or one clock cycle by expanding every pipeline stage to accommodate multiple instructions. So, the choices given are super pipelining, scalar pipelining, speculative pipelining and super scalar pipelining. So, let us try to understand what is this. We are talking about different potential ways to improve the IPC. Here, we are talking about a scenario where 
the pipeline can fetch and execute more than one instruction in a given clock cycle. So, fetching more than one in a given clock cycle, executing more than one in a given clock cycle. So, what is a setup that will support this kind of an execution? The four choices given, one is about super pipeline, second is about scalar pipeline, third is about speculative pipeline and the fourth is about super scalar pipelining. Let us try to see with the help of a simple diagram one by one. Let me talk about this diagram. The first one, at every instruction, you are going to fetch an instruction in every one clock cycle and one one instruction is getting over. This way is known as a simple pipeline, which is also known as a scalar pipeline. But we can see that here, they, we are not talking about more than one instructions are not fetched in a given clock cycle. Now, coming into the second one, super pipelining, you are going to fetch two instructions in the same clock cycle, one at the rising edge and the other one at the falling edge. So, it is like a higher clocking rate. This technique is known as super pipelining. Then, the speculative pipelining is also something similar to scalar or super scalar, but the term speculation is being used, which is not connected to the pipeline speed. It is more or less connected to the branch prediction technique. The last one is known as super scalar pipeline with a width of 2 that has been shown here. I am fetching two instructions. So, two instructions are essentially getting over in every clock cycle. So, you have multiple execute as well. So, fetching more than one instruction that is known as super scalar pipeline or multi issue. So, super pipelining is wrong, scalar pipelining is wrong, speculative pipelining is wrong and super scalar pipeline is the correct answer for this. Now, let us go into some of the concepts we learned in GPU with respect to streaming. We know that display refreshing for streaming that is being required. So, consider an HD display which is having 2000 by 1000 pixels with a refresh rate of 100 frames per second and in order to refresh a pixel, it takes 50 instructions. Now, a processor at 1 gigahertz with an IPC equal to 2 is used to process this display. What is the minimum number of such processes required to ensure quality display streaming? First, let us try to understand what is the problem. We are talking about a problem wherein there are 2000 by 1000 number of pixels and this many pixels has to be refreshed 100 times a second and to refresh a pixel, it takes 50 instructions. So, we will be able to compute the number of instructions required to refresh the entire number of pixels 100 times. Now, a processor with 1 gigahertz with IPC equal to 2, instructions per cycle equal to 2. So, 1 gigahertz means your 1 clock cycle is uh, going to be 1 nanosecond. So, in 1 second, you have 10 power 9 clock cycles and the IPC instruction that can be completed per clock cycle equal to 2. So, 2 into 10 to the power of 9 number of instruction that it can process. Now, we have to see the capability of a processor and the total number of instructions that has to be completed in a second. So, the total pixels processed per second is 2000 by 1000 into 100 times. So, 2 into 10 to the power of 8 pixels per second is the number of pixels that you have to process per second. But one pixel processing requires 50 instructions. So, hence, if this many pixels per second that you need to process, that means 10 to the power of 10 instruction execution is required per second if you wanted to get a good quality streaming. So, this is all about the application side. From the application, total 10 to the power of 10 instruction execution has to be completed per second. Now, for a 1 gigahertz processor at IPC equal to 2, 1 gigahertz means you have 10 to the power 9 number of clock cycles per second into 2. So, 2 into 10 to the power of 9 instructions can complete in 1 second. So, that is a capability. So, this will show the requirement from the application and this will show the capability of one processor. So, how many such processors are required? That is the question. So, we require 10 power 10 divided by 2 into 10 to the power of 9. So, 5 such processors are required to ensure quality streaming in this uh, particular problem. So, what we try to see? We see the requirement from the application side and then we see what is the capability of the host processor. We require 5 such kind of processors in order to get a quality streaming. That means, to execute 10 to the power of 10 instruction per execution, one processor is not sufficient, five processor of similar capability is required. So, it is in this way. So, the question is, what is the minimum number of such processors required to ensure quality display streaming? The answer is 5. 
Let us now take a problem in image indexing. Consider an image consisting of 12 by 12 pixel width and height dimensions. Assume it is stored in a raw major format in memory. What is the index of pixel 86 and indices of the first and last pixel of column number 5? So, you know that we are going to talk about an image which is starting from 0 to 11 and again it is starting from 0 to 11. Now, we have to consider the indexing of it. It is a 12 by 12 image that is already been given 12 rows and 12 columns and these rows are numbered from 0 to 11 to 0 to 11. Now, we are talking about the first pixel, pixel of 8 of 8. What is been given is whatever is the row number that is mentioned into the dimension 8 into 12 into 6 so, that is called 96 plus 6 is 102. So, what is been telling is this is going to be your raw major format. So, whatever you see in this first row it will come here then the second row would be stored like that if you look into your memory what I am talking here is about a pixel that is your 86 is my pixel size. This 86 will coming in which location. So, you know that if you have 12 by 12 pixel then if you store them linearly in an array it will range from 0 to 143. So, where is this 86 that is the question? The 86 is in location 102. Now, let us talk about the text one here. First element in the column 5. So, I, now I am interested in a specific column known as 5. So, it is indexed by 4. What is this element and what is this element? I am talking about the first element and the last element in column 5. Sorry, column number 5, it is not 4, it will be 5 here, column number 5. So, if you take up the first element, then it is the fifth element in the array, that is what you get. Now, if you look at the last element, then you have to understand last element happens in 11th row, row starting from 0 to 11 into 12, that is the dimension that is given plus 5. So, 137. So, from 143, if you go back, it is somewhere at 137 you get. So, this is set location 5, whereas this is set location 137. That is exactly what is been used from this. So, what we tried with this, we have an image and in the image, you know that the images, even though it is 2D, it is stored in raw major format and given an index inside an image, we have to find out which is the exact location inside the array that will give this. Now, let us move into an image indexing problem. Consider an image that is shown below. Identify the block IDX and thread IDX of image location 5 and 4. Same concept, but it is in a 3D. You know that an image it is going to be divided, this is a block that has been given and the image is further divided into smaller blocks of uh, smaller size. So, block of 0, 0 that has been given. Now, image of 5, 4 is what you have to do. Image of 5, 4 is, which is the location, this is what is called 5. So, how do you get it? So, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 and in this dimension 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So, this is the location what we are talking is, this is known as 5 and 4 and this is part of this particular block. So, this is the block number that I am talking. Now, what is the block ID if you look for that? This is the block ID of 2, 2, this is 0, 0 and this is going to be 2, 2. Now, within that, this is my point of interest within that block and what is going to be the thread ID? So, basically, 4 threads are going to handle it. Thread ID of x equal to 0, that set is been given and y equal to 1. So, this is called y equal to 0, and this is y equal to 1, x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. So, its thread ID is 0, 1, whereas my block ID is 2, 2. So, now in this case, you know that the row is going to be block ID into y into block dimension of y plus thread ID of y. If you compute that, your row is going to be what is block ID of block ID of y, it is 2 into block dimension of y, it is 2 by 2 block. So, it is 2 plus thread ID of y, it is called 1. So, that is why you get the row number 5. Similarly, the column number is given by block ID of x into block dimension of x plus thread ID of x. 2 into 2 and then this value is going to is not 4, it is going to be 0. So, that means you are getting 5. 
So, phi 4 is obtained in this fashion. So, given a phi 4, you are asked to find out the block ID and thread ID as per the dimension that has been given and that will take care of this uh, particular problem. So, this is the that has been pointed out by this. So, we have learned about some of the aspects of superscalar pipeline, VLAW processor and about some concepts in, in multi-threading and then we have taken some image uh, related problem especially in refreshing and one dimensional and two dimensional array accessing. I hope with this you got some background of some of the material that we have learned. With this we are coming to the end of the third module, it was a little longer module 3 and in the subsequent week we are moving into the memory hierarchy. So, with this we conclude this lecture, thank you and happy learning.